Let me first quickly summarize the argument I'm going to make uh, it because it's a bit, um, if not convoluted, uh, nonlinear. And so just to give you a bit of an orientation, um, uh, what I ultimately want to say is that our model for, um, uh, for how science is aimed at achieving and connecting to uh, social progress um, uh, has actually been um, a model of technological uh, advance and institutional um, structure, but not acknowledged as such. Um, and as a result, on the one hand, we have held uh, um, on a pedestal what, what um, Angela called originally the Cartesian dream, by which, uh, which I take to mean the idea that by understanding um, uh, with as much resolution as possible the underlying uh, attributes and phenomena of, uh, of the reality that we are embedded in, um, we can act uh, with greater um, wisdom, with greater uh, intentionality to achieve the things that we want. Um, if that's the, if that's the uh, Cartesian dream, and the policy implementation of that dream was therefore the best way to approach that uh, was through the advance of fundamental science, um, I would, uh, what I'm gonna argue uh, in, this, um, in this talk is that that's a, a, not only a grave misunderstanding of uh, the nature of modernity, um, but it's also led us in a direction that ultimately is, is, um, uh, is undermining the legitimacy of science itself. So um, with that modest uh, ambition, just a, a little bit of, of, of reasonable, of re recent casual evidence of what's going on. So here are just a few headlines uh, from the last couple of months. Um, that begin to to give you a sense of what you're all what you're all aware of is going on out there. So a recent editorial uh, um, by the by in, in Nature called "Misplaced Faith" uh, about whether or not the public actually um, the public's uh, confidence in science was was in fact uh, uh, merited given the increasing instances of scientific misconduct and. Uh, and bias and lack of replicability uh, in science. Um, this isn't just in the science literature, it's also um, uh, in the popular uh, media. The Washington Post, two articles from the Washington Post. Uh, one, the familiar sort of phenomena that, uh, that we know around, say, nutritional advice, uh, cholesterol, which for a long time in the US at least had been considered to be uh, something that one should avoid in one's diet, uh, that's being that recommendation is being backed off on. And then even, even a little philosophy of science in the Washington Post talking about the need for, for uh, scientists to uh, be trained in the, in, uh, in the notion of reproducibility in their work starting in graduate school. So the point is that, that certain sort of fundamental questions about both the reliability of science um, and the, uh, and the um, practice of science are now um, on an almost daily basis in the mainstream media and part of, uh, part of public dialogue. But I don't think that, um, uh, that this is really adding up to any coherent critique of what's going on. Um, so I wanna try to offer that. Um, so w one thing I should say is, is I'm American, I work in the American context, and so, so m many of my comments are offered from that context and may not be fully applicable to, uh, to the European context, but I think overall, based on con uh, continuation of conversations with, with uh, colleagues here, I think that they're, they're generally, generally applicable, but some of the examples I'll use will be from the US and, and um, uh, so in the, it may seem unfamiliar to you. But um, uh, the, guy in the, lower the guy in the upper left is Descartes, of course. The guy in the lower left is Vannevar Bush. Um, just curious, so who, who has heard of him? Okay, so, so he's, I, you could say, the father of modern uh, American science policy. He was uh, the, the, um, uh, basically the architect of the R&D enterprise during World War II, leading up to the Manhattan Project and the development of the, of the bomb, but also worked on radar and proximity fuses and 
things like that. Um, but most importantly for our purposes is, is that immediately after the war he was involved in a, um, a formative uh, political battle um, uh, over how science ought to be governed and his position was very much that of, uh, of the, the core precept behind science should be scientists need to be left alone to do their own thing. Um, and that the discoveries that, uh, that come from that, that uh, uh, hands-off, laissez-faire, autonomous approach to science would yield uh, the knowledge necessary for, um, for social advance. Uh, so scientific progress on a broad front, of, uh, front results from the free play of intellects, working on subjects of their own choice, in manners dictated by their curiosity. These are very familiar uh, tropes that get repeated over and over again. Um, and then uh, the, the second part of the quote, and these are actually separated by a lot of text in the actual report that this comes from, but it's a very important uh, part of the idea, is that basic research, that is this free play of, play of free intellects, is the pacemaker of technological progress. So. Um, so that remains, um, and of course it's not entirely false, but it remains at least in the U.S. and I would say in the U.K. I may be perhaps a, a bit less so uh, the farther east one goes, but it remains a very powerful uh, cultural touchstone um, in the way we think about uh, think about science. So, so one version of that. Um, and this was a very, very politically important version in the, in the US was that what allowed us, and again, I'm, I'm not endorsing this view of things, I'm simply um, uh, trying to summarize the way, the way I think uh, things are often uh, understood, but, but, but if, if the, the, ex, the, the detonating of two nuclear bombs on Japan uh, symbolized the end of the war and this uh, triumph of, uh, of wartime technology, of military technology, um, it's very much understood as a direct derivative from the mind of Albert Einstein, the development of a relationship between, uh, between um, mass and energy, and, uh, and the idea that through uh, this insight, we then were able to achieve the technological supremacy necessary to win the war. And this mythology, very powerful in the formative years of American science policy, um, very powerful uh, legitimator of, of Bush's view of things, and still um, in, a, in a somewhat uh, diluted state, I think has very important cultural, um, uh, cultural let's see, inertia. Um, on the other hand, what's almost never discussed is the much less interesting question of, of uh, well, what was the organizational or institutional structure that actually led to the creation of, a, uh, of, of nuclear weapons in a very short period of time? Um, and needless to say, uh, so does anybody know who the guy in the lower right is? Just curious. So, so he, he, his name is uh, Leslie Groves. He was the general who ran the Manhattan Project. Um, and in stories of the, the, the mythological stories of the, of the nuclear bomb, he's almost um, never part of the story. Uh, we hear, hear about Robert Oppenheimer, who's a physicist who ran the scientific uh, part of the project, but Groves ran the organizational part of the project. Now, what I just simply want to say very quickly is it was an incredibly complicated, difficult, unprecedented organizational um, achievement as well. Uh, that uh, required thousands of science mobilized in many, many different places across the country, uh, lots and lots of money, of course, and a relentless focus in a very short period of time on moving to a particular technological achievement. And kind of bizarrely, this is not part of our, our collective myth about what it was that took us from Einstein to uh, incinerating two cities in, uh, in a short period of time. And, and part of what I'm going to argue in the rest of my talk is that, in fact, um, it's the neglect of this aspect of, of uh, science in society um, that has uh, led us to badly misunderstand what science is for, how it works, um, and how its value uh, is translated from new knowledge into um, social action. So, If you want to understand where modernity comes from, um, and you want to understand it in a, in a, in a simple, um, condensed way, 
the best way to think about it is that it comes from the military-industrial complex of the United States um, during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And this is a bit of an overstatement, I recognize, but it's actually, I, I wish it were more of an overstatement than it is. Um, but it seems to me that there is no significant part of the technological infrastructure that underlies our lives today and our economies today that cannot significantly be traced to uh, the Department of Defense and military expenditures in the U.S. Um, two great books on this, uh, one called Is War Necessary for Economic Growth by the economist uh, Vern Rutan and another called Trillions for Military Technology by uh, my colleague John Alec. Um, and just some, some early examples of this, so the, the, uh, uh, the first computer, the ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania, um, was uh, developed by the military to first to calculate trajectories of, uh, ballistic trajectories, and then to calculate um, uh, some aspects of the construction of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, below that, um, the first prototype of a Boeing 707, which was actually a military uh, airliner used to fuel other military airliners. Boeing used that design to then launch the uh, successful um, uh, civilian airline uh, industry, and then below that, uh, the first GPS satellite also launched by, by DOD. But, but everything that you depend on technologically, you can find significant roots in uh, the Department of Defense. And I want to go into just a little bit of detail about why that worked so well, if well is the right word. Um, so I just have a very quick top ten list about what it was about the Department of Defense and the military-industrial complex that made it such an effective uh, creator of world-transforming technologies. So the most obvious one is they had a lot of money to spend on R&D, and, and, but they didn't do the, most of that R&D themselves. Uh, the R&D was done either in universities or in private sectors. So that leads to number nine, which was strong and enduring ties to academia. Um, basically, after World War II, all basic research in the, U, in the U.S., all new basic research funding was provided by the Department of Defense. Um, a civilian capacity in basic research grew over the next 20 years or so, uh, but the DOD was incredibly important, not only in basic research, but in creating entire new fields like computer science and material science. Um, uh, another important aspect was, was that DOD did things in lots of different ways, and this is, I think, overall a strength of the U.S. Uh, innovation system is that they don't just, there's not just one agency, um, there's not just one approach. Uh, DARPA is famous, of course, for its willingness to take on high risks and its creation of the internet, things like that. Uh, but there's a lot, there, there's a, there is a, uh, uh, a gas turbine lab that's basically worked on progressive improvement of jet engines over a period of 30 years. So everything from this very high risk visionary stuff to, to very incremental continual, imp uh, focus on continual improvement. Um, some peer-reviewed, some not, lots of different approaches. Uh, another thing, of course, is that, that uh, early on, and it, when a technology is not necessarily reliable or anything that would have an application in, uh, uh, in the private sector and civilian life, DOD was a, uh, could be a test bed for, for uh, technologies. In fact, today it's being used in interesting ways to be a test bed for certain um, uh, types of energy technologies that would be too uh, expensive to be tried out in the civilian sector. Um, commitment to performance technology improvements. So the, the overall point about DOD was that they existed for one purpose, which was to enhance the security mission uh, of the agency, that DOD are in, uh, technology, uh, to, to, they existed to advance the security needs as defined by the Department of Defense. Um, and so uh, they had a continual um, and persistent focus on improved performance over many decades of the different technologies that they were uh, developing. Now, oops, what makes that unique and what makes them different from almost every other uh, creator of technology was it also, they didn't care how much they spent for stuff, right? So, so the ENIAC computer, the first computer, which had about all the power of, of the, I doubt we have a microchip that's as, as small as the power of the ENIAC computer, which took up several rooms and took dozens of people to run. Um, but uh, that was hundreds of thousands of dollars for that, that thing that basically accomplished nothing by today's standards. Um, but it was seen as advancing the military mission and the money was uh, seen as worth investing. The point being that 
they were totally insulated from the marketplace. So anything that seemed interesting, anything that seemed important, anything that seemed potentially relevant to the mission could be invested in. Uh, fourth uh, point is that um, the essence of the military industrial complex, of course, was, was, was uh, military defense contractors, that is Boeing, Grumman, the large, uh, 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 the Northrop, the large um, General Dynamics, the large companies that created the technologies uh, were very much tied to DOD in terms of um, their capabilities uh, and the development of the products that allowed them to be, uh, to, to be profitable. Um, third point, very important and often neglected, is that, is that um, these companies didn't just get a free ride. They weren't just given billions of dollars to do whatever they wanted. They had to deliver a product to DOD that did what DOD wanted it to do. Now there's lots of stories about wasted money on technologies, but overall, uh, if you look at the development of weapons systems, in the end, um, they, at, often at unbelievable cost, they did deliver the technological function that DOD wanted. So there was this relationship of actual accountability uh, from, the, uh, from the defense contractor firm to DOD to advance the mission. Um, and uh, then the last two uh, are maybe obvious. Lots and lots and lots of money spent over decades uh, to advance technologies that otherwise would have no rationality uh, in the private sector, in the civilian sector, and no possibility of entering the marketplace because of their cost and unreliability in their early stages. And then finally, um, a political consensus that, uh, that understood uh, that there was a, a, a Cold War going on with the Soviet Union, that it was an existential uh, uh, type of existential combat um, that needed to be fought with all uh, resources possible, and that this unified the political parties in a way that allowed the investments to be made year after year. So, um, so it was this context, I will argue, that essentially allowed the very rapid proliferation of transformational technologies, um, everything from aerospace to satellites to, to, um, uh, to remote sensing to telecommunications to the internet um, that created our world. And it was a very specific context, um, and especially it was a very particular type of innovation ecosystem. Um, and had it not been for that innovation ecosystem, all the science in the world would have never created what it was uh, that we ended up uh, having as, as kind of defining elements of our technological infrastructure today. Um, that being said, um, almost no one really talks about that. What we really like to talk about is the free play of free intellects, working on subjects of our own choice and manners dictated by curiosity, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, there was lots of basic science going on. But most of that basic science was, in fact, um, funded uh, in ways that were very complementary with the needs of the Department of Defense and the needs of industry. And that's been, I think, demonstrated very clearly um, by uh, economists of innovation over the last 20 years or so. So um, the part of the argument that I want to make that I think is um, maybe least comfortable and especially makes my STS colleagues most mad at me um, is, that, is that our sense of truth and reliability in science is actually not about science, it's about technology. There's a phrase in English, um, uh, uh, um, it's not rocket science. Has anybody heard that? So, so when you say it's not rocket science, what you, what you mean is, you know, uh, you don't have to be a genius to figure it out. But of course, rocket science wasn't rocket science either. Rocket science was almost entirely engineering and applied science. So, so even our metaphors um, take the, the very um, orchestrated aspect of, uh, of the innovation system of the Cold War and turn it into something um, that sounds more like Einstein and the, and, and the bomb. Um, and, and what I want to suggest is that this is actually a source of really powerful and, in the end, damaging confusion. Because, because when we think about where reliability comes from, that is, knowledge of how things work, it does, certainly does not come from our knowledge of science, that is, as, as citizens of the world. It comes from our engagement of, with natural laws via technologies. You turn on a light switch, the electrons flow. Um, you, and and, and uh, it is, 
this technological mediation of natural phenomena that are articulated by science that is mo almost everyone's experience of the reliability of knowledge. But we never think about it that way. We think about it as the reliability of knowledge and the correspondence between our knowledge and the reality out there as being a function of science. I think empirically, it's clearly a function of technology. For most of us, we never encounter scientific principles. We encounter technology that instantiates those scientific principles. So why does that matter? Here, here we go. It matters because um, at the same time as the military, military industrial complex was working its magic or its evil or, how, or, or both, however you'd like to interpret it, needless to say, science was doing its thing. Scientists were out there publishing articles. Science were out, scientists were out there asking difficult questions, trying to understand difficult problems. Um, and certainly the free play of free intellects was very much at work in parallel with this creation of this uh, technological infrastructure by the military industrial complex. And it turns out that at the same time as all this was going on, all this technological creation, two very acute observers of the science scene were looking at something different um, in Vannevar Bush's vision of science that was causing them significant concern and that, and that actually was amazingly prescient in terms of the challenges that we're seeing uh, today. So one of these, the, these two people here who um, are probably unfamiliar to you uh, on the left is, uh, is, is Derek uh, Price and on the right is Alvin Weinberg. Derek Price was a social scientist. He was a Brit who uh, made his way to Yale and was the first bibliometrician. He was the first person who began to apply um, looking at things like numbers of citations and numbers of articles and numbers of scientists to understand the science system. And, um, and what, uh, what Price recognized in the 1960s was that science had been undergoing exponential increase both in the number of scientists and in the production of scientific knowledge uh, for 600 years, um, and that it was uh, approaching a logical limit to where it could, could no longer continue to keep increasing because he did things like calculated that, that 30 years from when he wrote his book, Little Science, Big Science, um, every man, woman, and child in the world would have to be a scientist and every dollar of every GDP in the, glo in the globe would have to be devoted to science were one to continue the curves. Um, so, he actually, uh, and the top curve is uh, is number of actual number of articles. So that's uh, an empirical validation of of what he um, of what he recognized. But but what he predicted with amazing acumen um, was that this was going to have to reach a time of crisis when there was so much. Uh, growth in the scientific enterprise that it could not be sustained either in terms of the, uh, the structure of the population, uh, the devotion of, of, of private and public budgets to science, and the creation of knowledge. So just to give you a couple, to put a couple of numbers to this, uh, we're, up to about, we're up to about two million publications uh, a year. And, and the question of of what does that mean and how to make sense of that, um, I, I offer very, uh, very literally. Um, how is one to understand what, uh, what two million publications a year actually means in terms of the growth of knowledge and especially the growth of knowledge that's useful, usable, and correct? And I think we are, some of the uh, revelations of lack of reliability in, in scientific uh, publications um, are beginning to, uh, ask the question of what can we actually find if we consider that 1.8 million publications a year uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, again, the uh, growth of academic journals, so we're up to about, I think, about 14,000 journals uh, right now. So again, science uh, balkanized into hundreds and hundreds of disciplines and sub-disciplines. And we all know the way it's supposed to work, right? The way it's supposed to work is that, is that um, uh, science is a self-correcting, self-checking uh, social enterprise, and, um, and uh, in that way, even though any individual scientist may be flawed, even though indi any individual work may, uh, may not be um, uh, correct, in, in the end, uh, we check on one another, uh, so, uh, experiments get, uh, get confirmed or disconfirmed, and progress occurs. But the question of, of how that can actually happen 
um, when you have an enterprise that's so large that it's generating millions of articles a year published in tens of or 15,000 journals, 14,000 journals in many hundreds of subdisciplines is one that no one is really bothered to seriously, um, uh, to seriously ask. It is an assumption um, that, uh, that scientific excellence can be maintained um, within, that, uh, within that system, an assumption that I think uh, we're beginning to find is, is not supportable. So, so that's what uh, Price had to say. Weinberg had a very different, um, uh, different set of concerns, and those of you who have been hanging around um, Angela for a while uh, probably have heard the term post-normal science. I'm not going to use that term. I'm going to talk about Weinberg's term, which was trans science. But what, what Weinberg recognized, um, and he was a uh, nuclear physicist, worked at Oak Ridge National Lab, and was very much an advocate for nuclear power and nuclear energy, uh, so, um, uh, so his history resonates with your history here. Um, at the same time, was also very sensitive to the rights and prerogatives of a democratic society to make choices about the technological pathways that it would, um, that it would follow. And what Weinberg recognized, and this was in the 60s, was that there were emerging in society two things. One, a set of questions that seemed like they were about science, but actually, as he said, danced around back and forth across the border between questions that could be answered scientifically, things that were known and knowable, and things that could be asked scientifically but not answered, and that were potentially unknowable regardless of the amount of research that one did. And so he called science of the unknown and the unknowable trans science. And his key insight there was that trans science might look a lot like science and you could develop a lot of data around it, but that it was inescapably connected to politics because one had to make choices about how to define a problem, uh, how to model a complex system, which data counted as good data and which didn't and so on, um, in ways that could not be uh, verified or refuted uh, simply through the standard um, canons of, of, of scientific practice. So he understood that science was entering into a period uh, where its relationship with politics was going to become more, um, more intimate. And he said that, well, so, so given this, we have to, he was a little naive, we have to, well, maybe not, we have to establish the limits of scientific fact really are, and this requires the kind of selfless honesty which a scientist with a position or status to maintain finds hard to exercise. Um, so that was a bit prescient too, uh, but I think it, it, naive maybe to the extent that he didn't um, realize two things. One, how pervasive this type of science would, would become across a society that was dealing with environmental and economic and social issues that it turned to science to help answer, um, but also uh, how the limits of expertise in fact became contestable themselves and subject to, to, to political debate themselves. I think he underestimated both those problems. Um, one way to think about his notion of trans science that he, he kind of almost me mentions almost, almost in passing, but I think it's really powerful and it was further developed by the economist Dick Nelson, was, was he talks about science as, as focused on what he calls homogeneous things, um, things like atoms or molecules or chemical reactions, things that, again, my STS colleagues will be mad at me, I would say exist objectively in nature and for which science can converge um, in its understanding and characterization of. And he contrasted those with things that were heterogeneous, that is things where you had to agree about how to define what it was that you were lo what looking at. So, so the bottom left is a benzene ring. Um, we can characterize that, there's not much argument about it uh, as you go from the bottom left to the upper right. More and more heterogeneity. So you might use a mouse uh, to try to understand uh, the effect of benzene on the creation of, uh, of um, uh, mutated genes and, and cancer. Um, and you can use that mouse to, to, to maintain that, uh, that homogeneity because it might be a, a um, if it's a lab mouse, you can continue to replicate that exact same mouse, do the same experiment, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still only a mouse, it's not a person um, living in the real world. So you, you have that um, homogeneity at the expense of the complexity of reality. 
Then there's human beings and human health, yet more complex, even something as apparently straightforward as a tumor is a heterogeneous phenomenon. Obviously, we've learned incredibly uh, to our surprise, perhaps over the last 20 or 30 years, how the phenomenon of cancer is not one disease, can't be captured as in, in any homogeneous way, um, and uh, is still uh, becoming more and more complex in our understanding. Then if you think about something like a chemical waste dump uh, or a cancer cluster, uh, the whole question of who gets to define what the boundaries are, what the measurements are, um, uh, what counts as statistical validity, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things are highly hetero heterogeneous, meaning that they're contested even within science itself, and that co contestation will almost inevitably have a political element to it with a small p, a different discipline, for example, toxicology and epidemiology. If you deal at all with chemical risk, you know how those two fields hate each other. Um, and it's because they have different views about how to define uh, risk, toxicity, um, uh, et cetera, disease. Okay, so, so, um, so along with, with Weinberg's recognition that science was going to increasingly be engaged in problems of increase of, of, of with the subjects were heterogeneous, which he called trans science. He therefore realized that science would be more and more enmeshed in the political. So here's a bunch of headlines. Uh, they're all pretty, they're all from the era of uh, of Weinberg's. Um, uh, work, so the war on cancer in the U.S. and the question of, of uh, how carcinogenic is dioxins and uh, the question of how to protect um, uh, endangered species, um, diet and cardiovascular health, mammography, how, when should a woman get a mam mammogram and how, uh, and how frequently, a uh, famous case about the um, science advisors to the president and the um, decision uh, to not uh, go forward with the, super con with the uh, supersonic transport in the, 19 se in the 1970s. All of these were early examples of trans-scientific um, debates, and we can see that um, in almost no cases have they actually been resolved. In fact, in almost all cases, they continue, uh, but more in more complex uh, versions than they were in those early innocent days of trans science and politics. Um, so the, 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 what I want to try to put together here is, is uh, the question of what happens when you marry this exponential growth of the scientific enterprise with this increasing, um, uh, this increasing interpenetration of uh, science and politics plus lots and lots of money. Um, I made up this number, $100 billion a year. Uh, it's, it's two times the U.S. investment in what we call basic research and generally. Um, so, so it's my proxy for how much we spend every year on science uh, that allows scientists to pursue the, their curiosity wherever they want. Maybe it's too high by an order of magnitude or by a factor of two, but, but uh, I, I doubt it's too high by more than that. Um, but in any case, lots of money, lots of science, lots of publications, lots of scientists, and lots of politics. Um, so the essence of, of the kind of main point I want to make here is that what we have created is, is a, uh, um, a scientific endeavor that allows us to uh, stipulate um, uh, any hypothesis and test it uh, for any complex system that we're interested in. So this is simply one that's, that's uh, important in terms of public health in the U.S. Um, it's the question of, uh, of um, what's causing the rapid increase in obesity in the population. Um, this is a, a, an obesity system influence diagram, and it basically um, uh, tries to show every single possible causal element that, that the makers of this map could imagine, and then connects, uses arrows to connect every one of them. Um, what I mean to simply illustrate is that it's a very complex system with very many factors involved in it, almost all of which are being studied by scientists. Uh, the big arrows point to two, um, genetic predisposition, lots of work done on that, I'll show you in a minute. And the other, efficiency of consumption, um, that is to say, you're a poor mother living in the inner city, your kids come home from school, you wanna give them a decent meal, you take them out to eat crappy fast food at McDonald's because it's fast, it's quick, and it's cheap. Um, so those two, plausibly, part of this, uh, part of this system, and then of course, one can do research uh, on both of those. Uh, 
So this is just some quick bibliometrics I did this morning. I hope you'll excuse me. It's probably not. In fact, I think these are probably low, but I, I was just using PubMed. Um, so in the last 10 years, 36,000 papers on obesity, 4,000 on genetics, 5,400 on diet, and uh, 3,100 on uh, mouse models. Okay, so, and I don't know how much overlap there is. I don't make any claims for rigor here, but just to give you a sense of the overall scale, okay. Um, and then this plays out in the peer-reviewed literature, and presumably this is good science, right? So this is the... Uh, the, the uh, fat mass and obesity index, the FTO gene, um, and here's a, a paper that identifies it, and it's been cited over 2,500 times since it was uh, since it was first published. And that um, so that's the replicable, high quality, peer-reviewed science in one part of the map, and. Then here's uh, something about uh, proximity to junk food and how that um, influences uh, your caloric intake. Um, that sort of insight hasn't been cited as much, but it's also in the peer-reviewed literature. Um, I don't, the International Journal of Obesity, I actually don't know how long that's been around, but, um, but presumably uh, relatively recently. And, um, and this kind of information feeds into the advocacy of, uh, of civil society groups like the Center for Science and the Public Interest, which is a um, food safety organization. So that's a completely different part of the, uh, part of the, um, uh, of the causal chain. Now, so, so all of this good science gets to support uh, whatever particular causal model you'd like to um, invoke around obesity, but also gets to support whatever particular political model for dealing with the problem of obesity that you'd like to. So, um, so, so it's a phenomenon that, that, uh, that I've referred to as the excess of objectivity. There's lots and lots of facts um, that are scientifically verified to go around. And I think this is a characteristic of, of uh, trans science, and it's a characteristic of, uh, that doesn't go away as you try to understand these complex phenomena. It actually uh, gets, exa gets exacerbated. So, so what are the, what are the, um, the, the major uh, phenomena that we're seeing as a result of this proliferation of, of, of trans science? And I think, there are two, you're familiar with them, I just want to um, quickly run through uh, some of the uh, emerging evidence around them. Um, one is this continual evolution of, uh, of advice about how we ought to behave um, in, uh, in light of our immersion in the technologies of today. So the, the, if you followed all the, the mammogram, evolution of mammogram advice, it's actually quite extraordinary. Um, and uh, I, I looked at, there's, there's been about 10,000 articles in the New York Times on mammograms since the mid-1970s. I've looked at maybe 10% of those. Um, but the, the, the pendulum swings are quite, uh, quite incredible. And so the standard argument um, from the uh, Vannevar Bush view of things would be, well, this is a hard problem um, and we're making progress. Uh, but I think as an empirical matter, um, at a certain point one has to say what would, what would progress look like and what is your evidence that we're making progress. Um, because at the same time that we're having all of these continual shifts in advice to, to uh, women about, um, uh, about whether they should get mammograms or not, um, our understanding of breast cancer itself is changing. Uh, the populations who are getting mammograms are changing. And so there is no fixed uh, target there's no equivalent of a molecule or a chemical reaction uh, um, to, uh, for, for science to focus around and for there to be agreement about. Now, of course, they do population, scientists do population-wide studies, um, but incredibly, those population-wide studies seem to show very, very different things depending on where they're done, when they're done, um, what they're controlled for, and so on. So, so I think as an empirical matter, very difficult to say uh, that we're actually converging um, on anything that looks like regular science. It seems like we have more and more trans science. Another example, this is a thing that's really kind of woken the, the science establishment up about, uh, uh, about this problem. And that is, um, so some of you may recall probably um, a dozen years or so ago, there was lots of really interesting evidence about um, how uh, 
clinical trials run by the pharmaceutical industry tended to be biased in favor of approving, uh, of showing more efficacy than there really was in the drugs. And that was like surprise. The pharmaceutical industry is biased towards, um, towards findings that would increase its profitability. You know? so, and that some actions were taken there. And although some of the good social science around that showed that, that while it was true that much of the work um, what could be interpreted as biased towards what the pharmaceutical industry's interests were. Um, it wasn't as if they were making up data. It was they, they were designing questions and, and tests that uh, were more likely to elicit positive outcomes than if they had been a, a skeptical audience. But one always has to make judgments in the world of trans science. Um, but what's really, I think, blown the lid off, so that was, so, so, so it was easy then for the science establishment to say, well, that's just the greed heads at the pharmaceutical industry. This isn't really about science, the kind of science that we do, which is, is pure and honest and, and, and unattached to, um, to the profit motive. Um, but, but, it began, but, the, but the pharmaceutical industry began to be somewhat suspicious of the fact that, that huge percentages of their um, clinical trials, which were based on preclinical work and basic science, uh, especially animal research, um, uh, in academia were failing. And what this, uh, this is not a, a time series, it's just a, a bunch of different diseases showing. The, so the, the, um, the, the graph on the, 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 uh, the, the y-axis on the right is the one that you want to pay attention to. Um, it just shows what the percentage of drugs making it all the way through clinical trials so that uh, they were approved for use um, in, in, uh, with, with, with patients, what the percentage is for different diseases. And the key one is oncology, because uh, cancer, of course, remains the thing that uh, we're not making much progress on. And so something like six or so, so 95% of, of uh, cancer trials fail uh, at some point. And um, so a couple of companies became suspicious about what was going on, and uh, Bayer Corporation and Amgen Corporation, each independently, and I don't know if they were talking to each other, but, but they, they came out with these results independently, tried to replicate uh, a bunch of academic studies that they had used to, um, uh, to guide them in doing their clinical trials. And, and I think Bayer was only able to replicate something like 25%, and Amgen it was much less than that, it was like 8%. Um, and they published this in Nature, and so suddenly uh, the, 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 the story was reversed. It was actually the private sector um, looking for reliable knowledge that it could use uh, to drive innovation and profitability, um, figuring out that so much of the science that they were getting was, uh, was no good. And that kind of opened up the floodgates. Now there's one other aspect to this, a guy who I think deserves a Nobel Prize, John Ioannidis, who's now at, at Stanford. Um, he anticipated all this. He wrote in the mid-2000s um, a paper called Why Most Published Research Findings Are, are False. He, as a matter of um, uh, a statistical inference, um, uh, thought that he um, could argue that, uh, that given the complexity of these systems, given the multiplicity of hypotheses that could be tested, um, given the small sample numbers uh, and the even smaller effect sizes, uh, given the um, uh, cultural institutional biases and, and publication biases towards positive findings, um, that one would, that he'd be very surprised indeed if, uh, if the average um, uh, published result was, uh, was replicable or verifiable. And um, uh, since I'm a sucker for these things, I, I, the minute I saw this article, I started teaching it, but, if, but, but um, of course he was considered to be a, a nut uh, at first, or at least was ignored. Um, but he has put together an unbelievable corpus of articles showing this phenomena across many, many different types of research, almost all related to human health, uh, nutrition, genetics, et cetera, but, but really um, impressive and depressing and somewhat shattering. Uh, so, um, so, there, so there has been an increasing effort of a small number of researchers uh, to document this phenomenon of, uh, of unreliability uh, across a major field. And the, the point I want to uh, emphasize here is that the reason this, this is an assertion, can't prove it, that the reason this is emerging in biomedical research and not in other areas of research is precisely that there is such a high expectation that biomedical research lead to improved outcomes in things like human health and development of drugs. 
And it's the, it's the slow pace of that that, um, that has led to the scrutiny of that particular science. There's vast areas of science in other domains where we actually have no ability to do these, these types of tests because there's no end point like a drug or reduced mortality that we can test it against. This became uh, fodder for the mainstream media, a, an excellent article uh, in The Economist about uh, two and a half years ago now. Um, and when you begin to look for something, you can often find it. Uh, the number of retractions in the media has uh, rapidly risen, I mean, in the scientific uh, uh, literature. And uh, recently, an incredible statement by the editor of Lancet, the case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. And that's bad enough. And then if you ask which half, <laughs> you should really be troubled. Okay, so along with this problem of reliability um, is uh, the accompanying problem of politicization. So once one has all this verified published knowledge, and I won't use the word cherry picking, I would say once one has a theory Within, with, with which to go forward in the world, one can find verified, peer-reviewed science to, to, to assemble a picture of the complex system you're engaged in to um, endorse your particular view of things. Um, it, this may be an extreme example, but I think not. Uh, I think if you talk to most scientists about GM crops, they'll say there's no problem. Uh, nonetheless, there is a, a group of scientists who have, um, lots of whom are activists, but so are lots of the ones who say there's a consensus, um, who have uh, 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 published uh, an online open letter saying there's not a scientific consensus on GM safety. But more importantly, if one looks at the social science around, say, the European opposition to GMOs, it's not about science at all. It's about not liking Monsanto. It's about not liking the flavor of American tomatoes. And I can tell you, I don't like the flavor of American tomatoes, right? It's about not wanting European landscape to look like Iowa or Nebraska. Um, whether or not those are reasonable fears, the point is that those are not fears that can be adjudicated through particular research programs. Um, so they remain uh, underlying particular um, sets of, of scientifically uh, uh, supported claims about GMOs. And then, of course, in the U.S., there's climate change. Um, I'd love to give a talk without talking about climate change. I've been ab ab absorbed. It's like a black hole. You can't get away from it. Um, and, and so I, I want to try to make a couple of statements about it without actually going into it. But the phenomenon of politicization of the science of climate change in the U.S. is really extraordinary and interesting. Basically, if you're left of center, you believe in the science and you believe that, uh, that this is a very serious problem that needs to be dealt with. If you're right of center, you more likely don't. Now again, great social science on this showing this doesn't have to do with science literacy. In fact, the more conservatives learn about climate science, the less trustful of it they are. Um, and the more liberals learn about climate science, the more trustful of it they are. And these aren't scientists, this is the public, right? So, so the whole model of why it is that we think that science, which should deliver a reliable picture of the world, could then translate into a unified view of how to politically move forward um, is thrown into, an, in, into disarray. So this is, a, I think, a, a, a sh sort of a shocking revelation to those who have simply thought that as we do more research and learn more, we'll, have, uh, we'll, we'll bring people together and figure out what to do. Um, I, I believe this. I mean, why wouldn't you have to be an idiot not to believe this, right? The, the, the point being, we all have our mental models of the world, um, and we all have, have lots of science out there that we can choose from in supporting those mental models. So, um, What I'm suggesting is that there's actually a, uh, a really serious, systemic, deep institutional problem that we're going to have to come to terms with. Um, I would say that the science community and the mainstream science institutions are, are beginning to tread there. I think nature has been, I, I have a conflict of interest here since nature has been very good to me, but they've, they have been um, uh, 
perhaps the most willing, along with the editor of Lancet, to step out and begin to acknowledge a problem, but even they can only take it so far, right? So it's one thing to say that this, this is a problem of, um, of science that isn't quite as good as it ought to be, as statistics that need to be made better, uh, of, of scientists who are dishonest or who, uh, who cherry pick their data or whose hypotheses aren't adequately um, uh, formulated or who go hypothesis shopping after they uh, collect their data. It's one thing to say that, and that's what mostly does get say, said. And it's another thing to say that actually we could still have these problems even if all of the science out there was, uh, was excellent, was verifiable, um, and was done uh, under the highest standards of science because the complexities of these systems allow us um, to, to establish infinite uh, numbers of causal chains. Probably all the, um, certainly all of these things exist. Um, so, but, but uh, the point I want to make is that at this point what the system is allowing itself to say is, is that um, there is a problem and I think that's it's admirable, and I think many in social institutions would have, would have a hard time owning up to that, so uh, the system is able to do that. Um, but there is a, uh, there's a focus on, on uh, liars, scoundrels, and cheaters, uh, as this New York Times um, op-ed piece uh, from, a, from a week or so ago uh, shows, because it, it's, it's certainly a lot more comfortable to say that this is a problem of poorly trained science, uh, scientists, bad statistics, um, uh, than it is to say that there's actually a fundamental epistemological problem at stake here. Um, and then there's the, this is the, uh, uh, the, the other alternative, which is, is um, if, if only we had enough money to support all the scientists, then there wouldn't be this pressure to publish and this positive publication bias and this need to do, uh, to hype one science uh, and so on, all the things that we know are, are a problem in the system. Um, and so one, uh, there's, a, there's an article by uh, some very um, uh, high-level uh, uh, life scientists, Bruce Alberts and Harold Varmus, both former um, uh, National Institutes of Health director, Shirley Tillman, former pres uh, president of Princeton University, um, acknowledging that there's a problem, um, acknowledging that uh, there need to be reforms, but not backing off from the idea that, that in a perfect world, where we had all the money that we needed, that is a world where Derek Price, um, uh, his predictions were wrong, uh, these problems would go away. And it's interesting, that just this quote, that the strains have been building for some time, but it's difficult to recognize them in the midst of so much success. So that statement of so much success uh, obviously contrasts fairly strongly with the, the editor of Lancet's uh, assertion that, well, maybe there's 50% success, but you tell me which 50% it is, please. Hmm? Yes, exactly, yes, yes. So it's either half full or empty. Um, I'm gonna skip these two, well, uh, yes, I'm gonna skip these two slides in the interest of, of time and just, just quickly say that um, uh, I think there's, there are uh, subjects of hope and optimism here and they, they um, uh, lie in interesting institutional experiments that are going on in response to the difficulties of a world of trans science. Uh, I do think these types of questions, you know, how much science do we actually need, how should it be organized, who gets to decide what's good, who gets to decide what's science, um, and who does it, um, uh, and why we're doing it, all of these things need to be on the table for discussion, for open and fearless discussion. And um, so just, just a, a couple of quick examples of, I think, really interesting, intriguing institutional experiments that are emerging because these problems have been recognized in the real world. There's a wonderful group called Patients Like Me. Basically, um, it was formed by two brothers who lost their third brother to amyotropic lateral sclerosis. They were, they, were, they were MIT engineers, they were smart, and they were incredibly frustrated by the inability of the, um, of the biomedical system, research system, to help and to learn. And so what they've done is they've used social networking technology to bring patients together, to um, bring their real world experience as individual patients um, uh, into a uh, so social conversation that allows learning to go on from the practical experience of patients on the ground. Um, second example, uh, the Toxic Use Reduction Institute in Massachusetts. Um, some of the elements of this have actually been incorporated in REACH in the, in the European Chemical uh, Regulation Framework. Um, but here the idea is that we're going to stop arguing about whether chemicals are toxic. Uh, 
uh, or not, uh, or how toxic they are, or whether they should be regulated, because the regulatory system in the U.S. has entirely failed. Um, if we think something might be toxic, uh, we're going to work with companies to find substitutes uh, that they can use instead to fulfill the same functions. The, the key insight here is that technologies are actually important and ways of life are organized around them. If you go to a company and say you can't use that, tech, that chemical anymore, they're going to resist because it's clearly a, an assault on their business model. If you go to them and say, we're going to help you adopt a different chemical to, to achieve the same function that won't affect your bottom line and that will allow you to then say you're greener, um, they will in fact be responsive. One obvious point here is that it requires a different type of science and a different type of institution. And it's been very difficult for Turi to get traction beyond the state of Massachusetts where there's a law um, that created them because most universities aren't equipped to do this kind of science. They're equipped to do Vannevar Bush type science. And one, uh, one final example. Um, uh, so this is just a, a, a meant to compare the experience of trying to bury high level nuclear waste in the US and Sweden. Um, very quickly in the US what we tried to do was prove it with science and then ram the science down the public's throat. They didn't want it. Um, in Sweden, they actually opened the process up to uh, democratic decision making, to a voluntaristic approach where municipalities got to sign up as potential candidates for sites and got to back off if they decided in the end they didn't want to do it. And as far as last I heard, they've actually selected a site. Uh, I don't believe they've uh, begun excavation there yet, but, um, uh, but the point is that they tame trans science not by doing more science. Um, but by opening the process of decision making up to transparent democratic uh, discourse. So, the dream is over, and uh, I think that, and, and, and so fortunately for you is my talk, and um, the question is, can we embrace these experiments in designing a, a new, more generative, more, uh, more um, uh, science system that's responsive to the complex reality that science and technology have themselves created? So thank you for your patient attention. <laughs>